Now, I don't think 500 Global does invest into mainland China, but what is your reaction to that executive order? Well, thanks so much, Ed, for having me. And it really makes me reflect back to the early days of 500. We just celebrated our 13th anniversary a couple weeks ago. So we to go back to 2010, very different era in Silicon Valley and technology and venture capital. Um, what has really evolved over the, the last 13 years that 500 has been investing globally is certainly um, huge growth in venture funding, tech penetration worldwide, but also, and particularly in the U.S., this intersection between tech, venture, and policy. So I think this will only increase. Um, as you mentioned, 500 Global, uh, we, we aren't active in China. Our focus has largely been investing U.S. and globally, and for us that really means what we've actually referred to as the rise economy. So 25 of what we see as the largest, fastest growing economies in markets like Indonesia, Malaysia, Turkey, Mexico, and so forth. And we've seen great opportunities there. Well, at the heart of the Biden story, though, is the, the merits and benefits of investing in U.S. tech versus international markets. So some of those countries you listed, what is it about them that makes them as attractive as a venture, a, a backed investment into a, into a founder or a or even a larger startup, because you're at multi-stage, right? Yes. Well, early on, we, we began investing uh, both in the U.S., Silicon Valley, but outside of the U.S. since 2010. And today, our portfolio is more than 2,800 companies. About half of that portfolio is non-U.S., specifically in those rise economies that I mentioned, like in Indonesia or, or Mexico or Turkey or, or so forth. What we have seen early on is that these are very large economies, fast growing from both population growth as well as GDP growth. And we took a bet very early on that because of the many trends that we were seeing in technology, if you remember 2010, costs to start a company were coming down dramatically. Online platforms like a Google, Meta, you know, previously Facebook, Twitter, mobile was really taking off in terms of Apple and Android, that all of this would make it just much uh, more cost effective and the barrier to start a company would come down. So as a result, we would start seeing a lot of big opportunities from founders building all around the world. And so that is really our belief. It continues to hold true. And for us, I think we're, we're going to just continue to uh, deepen, uh, deepen that exposure. Christine, you sound very busy. I mean, and I mean that kindly. Here on VC Spotlight, you know, we have a, a, a number of VCs that are sort of narrowly focused on early stage or growth stage, or the firm might have one early stage fund, one growth stage fund, but with a geographic narrow focus. 2,800 portfolio companies, 80 countries, multi-stage. Just from an industry perspective, how do you manage that as a firm? Well, you know, from the early days, a lot of that vision was really to find great opportunities, great founders in all corners of the world because of that bet we took. And our roots are certainly in early stage, and that continues to be an area we're very active in. However, a lot of the opportunity that we saw was that a lot of these markets that we took a bet on early coming online um, have now generated a number of big outcomes, either regional or, or global category leaders. And we've had a great opportunity because of the early relationships we've established with founders from you know, early on as either one of or the first institutional backer to, to really follow the founder's journey and help back them from pre-seed to pre-IPO. So for us, it's really in line with our, uh, certainly the original uh, vision and thesis, but you know, we're excited to, to keep supporting the founders um, in all corners of the world where they may actually need it more in terms of uh, the development of venture, the venture ecosystem. We showed some of your portfolio companies a moment ago, Canva, GitLab, Credit Karma, the names that jump out. The story of 2023, though, has been artificial intelligence. Are you focused on AI native companies or more AI adjacent startups that kind of want to jump in uh, and, and gain benefit from the tool of, of generative AI or a large language model? It's, it's definitely not, a, never a dull moment, especially as it relates to AI. And against the stark backdrop of the macro markets and valuations falling and funding dropping. But, you know, for us, because we have our roots in investing in a larger number of companies across a number of sectors, uh, one of the big benefits of that um, and really an advantage for us is to be able to spot what we see are emerging innovation, uh, not just in the U.S., but in all corners of the world. So as it relates specifically to AI, 
we have been investing in companies in the AI space for a number of years, and I think as we see uh, the the uptick in terms of companies building either like like you said they're going after the AI tech stack itself or kind of AI adjacent or really going after existing sectors from kind of an AI perspective. Uh, we definitely are leaning in and looking at all of those opportunities and, and then writing investments. Um, and I think what's quite unique, again, from our perspective, is that this is not just a Silicon Valley story or just a U.S. story. It's really a global story. Um, oftentimes what we've seen in the early days is that certain business models will start in the U.S. and then we, we see them happen in other parts of the world. But for AI, it really is happening in parallel um, in many different markets.